warm welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. And um, this afternoon's topic is a very important one. In fact, so important we maybe we should have considered it at the beginning of the week. But uh, Brother Roger Lewis is going to speak to us on how to develop focus in an age of distraction. And before we commence this afternoon, I'll ask our brother Cornelius Kellett to come forward and begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father who art in heaven, all praise, honor, and glory belongs unto thee alone, most high. And we gathered here are very glad to be able to offer to thee all our heart's desire to be with thee and to be educated around thy word, to be built up and strengthened in the hope of thy kingdom. We pray soon to come, dear Father, at the return of thy blessed Son, whom thou hast ordained to be king over all this earth. Most High, we see in this world around us and worry in particular for our young folks, for our children coming up. For dear Father, the world has a terrific, terrible influence upon them, dear Lord. By all this machinations to shorten their attention spans and make them think only on a surface level, dear Father. The commercials that they are inundated with day by day, dear Father, mere sound bites that give improper, uh, well, yes, improper impressions and, and insufficient information and misleading information, dear Father. The social medium, dear Lord, social media that also seems to be in each and every one of their hands demands their attention to keep up with a, an ever-increasing and very superficial attention to each other, all those friends that they have made who they may never see nor interact with in any depth, dear Father. Even the entertainment is a three to five second sound bites of mayhem, dear Lord, across the screen, keeping their attention and shortening it. The education system, dear Father, is not much better. It doesn't give them the depth of understanding that many, many of the subjects they purport to approach need for understanding. This particularly applies to thy holy book, dear Lord, the Bible. For being trained and conditioned in this manner for a surface and in insufficiently deep attention, dear Lord, they lose the ability and the uh, desire even to delve deeply as they ought, the need to, dear Lord, for salvation. And for some of us, dear Father, who age has begun to move, in whom age has begun to move, dear Lord, we are sometimes losing the ability to concentrate as we are. And so we welcome this opportunity, Father, to, to approach methods to be able to sharpen our focus and help us to do a better job of keeping up the attention span that we need to extract from thy holy word all the wisdom and salvation that it offers. We thank thee for Lord Jesus who will bring it all to pass. And we pray that we might please him in our attention to it and our obedience to it, dear Lord, as we give thee thanks for this opportunity in our master, Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before our brother Roger speaks to us on the subject of focus in an age of distraction, he's asked that we take a reading from Nehemiah in chapter 8 and verses 1 to 12. And I'll call forward our brother Brett Horton to lead us in that reading.
Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, and Shema, and Ananiah, and Arijah, and Hilkiah, and Maaseiah, on his right hand. And on his left hand, Pediah, and Michelle, and Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashbanar, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Joshua and Bani and Sherebiah and Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hadijah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tirshatha, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat, and to drink, and to send portions, and to make a great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Thank you for that reading. I'll now call forward our brother Roger Lewis to speak to us on how to develop focus in an age of distraction. Well, <clears throat> thank you, brother chairman. Good afternoon, dear brothers and sisters and young people. Um, this is uh, both an optional and uh, perhaps in a certain degree informal session. Actually, it came about because Brother Bob Kling said that he noticed apparently on my LinkedIn site that I taught matters of attention management, which is true, it's what I do. And he said, maybe it would be a good idea to have a session on that. Um, whether he thought that was necessary for people attending the Bible school to learn something about attention management, I'm not sure. But... Um, it, it, there are things that are valuable in terms of the idea, and so what I'm going to give you this afternoon is some of the material that I would normally teach in organisations, uh, but we're going to come back to a biblical basis um, at the end of our study because there's, I think, a very high degree of relevance to, uh, to what, we, what we do in our lives in the truth. I'm going to start with a, a handful of practical ideas uh, that you can use personally. And then I'm going to give you some warning about dangers, and then we're going to come, come, we're going to come back to the Bible uh, at the end by way of illustration of sort of pretty much everything we've spoken about this afternoon. Now, before we start, a um, little bit of housekeeping. Have you all got a paper and pencil? 
Excellent. What I would like you to do, please, is as I'm talking, uh, I'd like you to start jotting down anything that turns up in your mind at random that you need to do. Now, it might be something you need to do today at the Bible school, but it might be something you need to do as soon as you get home, or it might be something you need to do with regard to the family, or it might be something you need to do with regard to work when you get back. Anything, because what happens is the brain is a remarkably random instrument. And even when we're supposedly paying attention to something or somebody, the brain will think, oh, I must remember to do that. I want you to write that down straight away. Just capture the thing and, and, and take a note of it because this method of my madness, I'm going to bring you back to that little list that you wrote down. So I need you to have at least two or three things on your piece of paper. If you can't think of anything to do in your life, I'm deeply concerned because <laughs> there really ought to be uh, a handful of things. So here's, here's the problem, isn't it, brothers and sisters, of the age in which we live in. We live in an age of information that on the one side is supposedly helpful, but on the other side comes to us at such a rate of velocity, with such complexity, in such quantity, in such frequency, and with such ubiquity, that it's impossible to cope with the degree of information that's been released upon an unsuspecting world. And it's the reality of the age in which we live. Now, a noted person who was an expert on this once said, and I think it's a very cogent comment, and bear in mind I've got several quotations here from obviously non-Christadelphian sources because this is to do with what I teach in organizations, but he said, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. It's a paradox really, isn't it? Because you see, what information consumes is the attention of its recipients. In other words, there's a price to pay. You ever heard the term pay attention? It's probably unintentional, but the fact is there's a price to pay for attention. There's a cognitive cost. And when we live in an information age, our attention is relentlessly demanded and in the end, you can't give enough attention because it's a finite resource. Here's a couple of definitions of attention. Um, this is from a, a UK expert. Uh, attention is the mechanism through which the brain focuses its resources. That's not a bad definition. In other words, it's a way the brain controls what it can or can't look at or think about or cope with. It's a mechanism to focus on what it can do as much as perhaps also what it can't do. So there's a clinical study that says attention is the mechanism which permits or inhibits information for further processing. The brain decides what it can pay attention to and also what it can't or won't pay attention to because it can't pay attention to everything. That's the problem. So our brain sort of acts as a gatekeeper to decide what comes through and what doesn't come through, you see. So William James, who was in the field of psychology, said, my experience is what I agree to pay attention to. And again, he said, for the moment, what we pay attention to is reality. Now, that really makes you stop and think, brothers and sisters. What he's really saying is that no matter how large the world's experience or knowledge is, imagine for a moment that um, if I just do that, oh, that's much better. Now I have your attention, you see. That's one of the benefits of black slides, is you must pay attention because that which distracts is gone. Now imagine that that screen behind me represents the sum total of the world's knowledge. What would we really know? I shouldn't have done that because it's put it back on, but I was trying to put a little wee pinprick of light because you'll know what I'm getting at, brothers and sisters, is we'd know precious little, wouldn't we? And yet out of that little wee tiny circle in the vast landscape of, of all human knowledge, we make sense of the world. We try and make sense of our entire world, but it's all based on what we've chosen to pay attention to. So the lesson is you better be careful what you pay attention to because it will shape your entire world. Now think about that with regard to the truth, what the implications of that idea is. So someone else once said, what captures your attention controls your life. And the New York columnist David Brooks says, therefore control of attention is the ultimate individual power. Living in a world of absolute distraction, your ability to control your attention 
is perhaps the greatest power that we have. Well, it's probably good for parents to know about this because our children are already facing challenges and if we think our children are facing challenges, imagine what our grandchildren are going to look like. It would be helpful to know a little bit about not only what the problem is, but perhaps more positively what we can do. So in my particular field, I talk about attention management in a sort of a sequence of things. It's not actually uh, sequential per se, uh, because they're all related ideas. But I think there's rules to help direct attention, which is about where your attention should be focused. There's codes to control your attention, which is about how to manage attention on a day-by-day -day basis. There are most certainly tools to defend our attention, which deals with when should our attention be protected. There are steps to sustain our attention, which is how our attention can be nurtured. And finally, there's keys to improve our attention, which is why our attention should be expanded. You see, it's a very, very fragile thing, attention. By the way, I'm an attention management specialist, well, in theory, and I'll have a wonderful idea upstairs in my bedroom, I'll think about it, and by the time I've got downstairs to my office, I come into my office and I think, what am I here in the office for? And it's already gone. Now, you know why it's gone, brothers and sisters, is because ideas in the brain, and this is partly what, what our brother Simeon dealt with in his evening session. You see, the brain is nothing more than synaptic connections across which are flowing both chemicals and electricity. And within a few seconds, the chemicals dissolve, and what was that thought is gone. It's absolutely true. If you don't capture it, it's gone. It's very, very fragile. So attention is a very powerful resource. On the one side, it, it can be consumed with all sorts of unnecessary things, but on the other side, it can be lost because we didn't capture it in time. If I was to show you what the brain looks like, strictly in a rather symbolic way, because this is clearly not a biological representation, <laughs> It's really about a whole lot of sort of cogs and, and pulleys and wheels, isn't it? All sort of, you know, hopefully grinding together and producing something at the other end. But if I was to ask you this question, what is the brain better at? Is it better at recognition or recollection? What would you say? And the answer is recognition. The brain is astounding with regard to recognition. They showed a group of people a set of slides and the slides came on a screen at the front of this room and they came at the rate of one per second. So imagine you're looking at 750 slides that are arriving like this. And then at the end of the 750 slides they put two screens up and two projectors and now they showed two photos simultaneously. By the way, the, screen, the slides could have been about people or buildings or landscapes or animals or plants or mountains, all sorts of different things. But then they put two screens up and two pictures came up and the group were asked, which picture did you see? Two mountain scenes, but one of them you've seen before, the other one you haven't seen. Now, which was the one you've already seen out of 750 slides at the rate of one per second? What do you think the percentage recall was? the percentage recognition was? The answer is 94%. They then did another test in a similar way, but in a different part of the world, where they showed several thousand slides to a group of people, and the recognition rate was 94%. If you show a person who's skilled in music a piece of black dots on a piece of musical manuscript paper, a person who's trained in music can say, Right, um, I can see that mostly this is crotchets and quavers. That's what we'd call them. I'm not sure what you'd call them in the States, actually. Crotchets and quavers, full notes or half notes or quarter notes. Is that what we'll be called over here? Crotchets and quavers is the English way, you see. Simeon would know what I'm talking about. Um, and I can also see that it's contrapuntal. I can see that there are inverted arpeggios. Actually, that's fugal form. In fact, I can see the mathematical precision of the notes running up and down in contrast to one another. And looking, that's Bach's fugue in A major. I can see it. I recognize the pattern. It's just astonishing what the brain is capable of doing. But you see, there's a lesson out of this. Because if that's true, then in terms of realizing what it is that we ought to be doing in life, the, the lesson of that is that this is a very bad place to run to-do lists. Because it's great at recognizing things, but it will never tell you what to do at the right time. 
Have you ever got home from a trip from the hall and said, oh, we were supposed to go and buy some milk or some bread or do something else on the way home, and the brain sent you a reminder just as you drove into your driveway? <laughs> or have you ever had your brain send you a very helpful reminder at three o'clock in the morning that you forgot to do something the previous afternoon? The brain is not good at recovering information and allowing you to recollect it at the appropriate moment of time. Computers are good at doing that, not brains. They're brilliant at recognition, very, very poor at recollection. So that's why most of us run to-do lists. Who's got a to-do list here of some form in their lives? I'm very comforted. Uh, to-do lists are good, they're helpful. Because all the research says that the moment you get it out of your brain and onto a list, even the brain sort of relaxes. The brain says, oh, thank you. Because if you don't do that, if you don't get it out onto a list, the brain continues to agitate about that. And the reason why it does that is because the brain cannot distinguish between past, present, and future. In time zone, it puts everything into the present. So even something that you don't have to do for six months, if it's not on a list, the brain will agitate about as if it's got to be done today. It sees it in the present. So we run to-do lists. But there's a few tricks to this, you see. So one of the things that I teach is that I think for any of us in life, and it doesn't matter whether we're mums and dads or grandmas or grandpas or busy people in business or retired, if there's things to do, I highly recommend that you have a list, that you run a to-do list of some form. But there's a catch to it, you see. Because ideas and things to do come to us at the at random moments of time, don't they? Just like those things you're writing down on your sheet of paper. Have you got anything to do in your life yet? Oh, yes, I forgot about that. Anything to do? Hands up those that have got something down at the moment on their to-do list. Wow, now that's pretty impressive. It just shows you that life is busy, you see. So here's the, here's the first, shall we say, practical suggestion for today. I think that you need to have, at all times, an attention capture tool. So the question is, is it simple to access? Because if you're going to build a trusted external memory, that's a fancy phrase for your to-do list, then you need to be able to have an attention capture tool that's available. Is it simple to operate? Because ideas and tasks arrive at any time of the day, and your attention capture tool's got to be easy to use. And is it simple to update? Because embedding the habit of noting everything is, is a new routine in itself, and so you want the facility to be absolutely simple to do. So after a lot of research, I decided what I thought was the best tool. Would you like to see my attention capture tool? Now it's high tech. And um, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is, this sinks every time. The battery never fails. And also there's a bit of science behind this, is the science says that when you take out a notebook and you write by hand onto paper, that cognition processes are better than typing a note into a computer. So I write it. I write things down. And actually if I'm in a conversation with someone and I say to them, look, that's a very interesting thought, I'll get back to you on that, and I do like this, and I say to them, well, what's your email address? Do you think that they might think that I'm going to get back to them? Oh, yes because I'm, I've captured the matter in my attention capture tool to deal with. What's the chance now that it will be attended to? Way, way higher than if I said, oh, that's really interesting, I'll get back to you sometime. <laughs> really? I don't think so. I can't see your attention capture tool. I have doubts that the chemicals and the electricity will stay in your synaptic connections all the while until you finally get around to this thing. If you don't capture it now, it's gone in about three seconds, actually, probably including my name. Now, there's a rule. When I discovered what, how important this was, and I'm not suggesting you can do this because you may be constrained for certain reasons which will become obvious, but I realized that if that was the case and that that was my chosen tool, and you see, you can choose whatever you like, but you've got to have it available everywhere, anytime. So I made it a rule that I only ever buy shirts that have a pocket right here so that I can have my attention capture tool. Even my casual shirts have got a pocket right here. You can buy a waterproof version of these to go in the shower because <laughs> you never know what you might want to capture when. Sometimes the best thoughts occur in the shower, you see. Well, that's true. 
So, so there's rules. But the point is, you need to have a capture tool. Now, not only do I have one here, but I generally have one beside my desk. I have one beside my bed. I have one, you know, you need, you need one in several places. So you can capture stuff at any point of time. So that's the first practical suggestion for today, having an attention capture tool. Here's the next one. Now, have you got that list of things? Have you got some things on your to-do list that you've written down? Right, here's the suggestion. What I'd like you to do on the same piece of paper is can you draw up four columns? So just draw some lines so that you create four columns, sort of spaced out across the page, uh, four columns. And I'm going to walk you through an exercise with regard to this uh, in a way which, well, I found this extremely helpful in my personal um, focus. By the way, this is about focus. You see, the attention capture tools are about focus, isn't it? Keeping on focus for things that have to be done. But here's the next stage up. I'm going to suggest that there's a big jump up from to-do lists. You can, you can turbocharge your to-do list into something much more productively powerful. But this is what we do. Um, it's about it's about what I describe as the power of next actions. Actually, it's not my terminology. It comes from someone else. But next actions replace to-do lists. And they replace to-do lists because the funny thing about lots of to-do items or to-do list items is actually what's to be done hasn't yet been clarified. Now, you might think it has, but it hasn't. I'll show you that in a minute. And that's obviously been put on back to front. But the point about this is that next actions require what's called front-end thinking, which means we've got to spend just a little bit of time really being clear on what it is that we've got to do. Um, and if we do it at the start of the problem rather than the end, generally it's helpful. Next actions reduce procrastination. Do you know that bright people procrastinate? Have you ever procrastinated? Well, you might be a bright person. Doesn't that feel good? Do you know why bright people procrastinate? Because they think, I must do that thing. Oh, but before that, we were going to set up a subcommittee to look at that. Oh, but before that, I was going to set up the parameters for the subcommittee. Oh, but before that, I need to set the rules for what the sub... Oh, look, I'll do this later. <laughs> and you start to overthink it. And what next actions do is they actually literally slow our brain down to say, no, 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 I just want to talk about just the next step. What is the next action? Nothing more, nothing less. But the critical thing is that that next action has got to represent the next real activity. So have you got those columns drawn up? Let me take you on a, an exercise to do that about how to create genuine next action items. Now, I'm talking about this at the philosophical level. Incidentally, you wouldn't do this every time you wrote something down to do, because it's a little bit complex, but it's to do more with a thought process here. So in your first column, if you like to write across the top of those columns, these words, column one, item. And all of these slides of mine, for some reason, are back to front and inside out and upside down, which all makes it extremely interesting. The next column is project. Column two is project, sort of like a heading. Column three is outcome. And column four is next action. So item, project, outcome, next action. Now, let me just walk you through those. So what I want you to do is to take one of the items on that list that you first wrote down, and I want you to transfer it. Now, before we do, two things. So don't jump the gun. It's no good saying, um, don't transfer an item if the item was ring bob, because that's already pretty clear what you're going to do. But if it's more something that's got several steps involved with it, it's a more complicated thing. I want you to do something that's got multiple steps before it's all finished. But secondly, I don't want you to change the wording. What you write down in that first column for item, I want you to use exactly the same words that you've already written down on your piece of paper. As the thing came into the mind, you captured it, write those words, transfer nothing other than those words into column one. So let me just give you a second to do that, and you can choose any item you like. You're not going to have to share any of these. You don't have to draw anything about what you're going to do. It's all secret and private and confidential, so relax. So take one of the items, don't change the words, make sure it's something that's got a few steps, and then write that in that column for item. All done? Got something? Right, here's the second one, and I'm, I'm going to have to sort of put all this up quickly so that we've got them. So now in the next column... 
under project, I want you to rewrite that item as if it was now a little mini project. So imagine if the item was, I'd put down a uh, tidy backyard. But now I'm thinking about it as a project, uh, and there are two critical things here. Uh, what would the project might be? The project might be um, to create the best backyard in the street. Oh, that's a bit of a step up, create the best backyard in the street. And notice that there's a word, there's a verb associated with this project. What's the verb? Create. So I want you to find the right verb to go with the project. Is it to create? Is it to organize? Is it to finalize? Is it to arrange? Is it to prepare? Is it to draft? Is it to develop? Is it to research? What's the verb that you would associate with that project? So turn it into a little project. Describe that item now as a mini project and put the right verb with it. What verb would you use to describe the doing or completion of this thing? Same item, but now in the form of a little project. You don't have to be too wordy, but I'm expecting that the number of words in that column will be more than the number of words in the first column. And then uh, once we've got to that, and I'm going to move on anyway simply because I see the clock ticking inexorably as time always does. This is, by the way, why I might suggest that time management has been, I think, superseded by attention management. You'll find that time management still seems to have the clock going at the same 60 seconds per minute whether you started time management or after time management, but what we've got to learn is attention management. We've got to figure out how to manage our attention. That's the crisis of the age. So you've got the project? Excellent. Now, in the next column, I want you to describe what that project outcome would look like when successfully completed. So let me give you the example I gave. Tidy backyard becomes, create the best backyard in the street becomes, now, how would I describe that project if it was completed? Any thoughts anyone like to contribute? If it was completed really well, by the way, what would the backyard look like? Give me the backyard. Show me, tell me about the backyard. Verdant lawns, manicured. Can you see the, can you see the, right? Beautiful flower beds, right? Trees pruned, barbecue area spotless, paving cleaned, the whole place a picture. Can you see that backyard? Oh, it's a treat. Now, that's what I want you to do with regard to that next column, the outcome. Describe the outcome. If it was done really well, what would it look like, feel like, taste like? Describe the outcome if you finish that little project. So just take a moment to describe the outcome so that you've got some clarity on what it is that you'd hope to get to once that project had been successfully accomplished. All right, and now we come to the last column, which is, now I want you to look at that project, look at that outcome, and I want you to now put into the fourth column just the very first logical, physical next action that you would need to take to start to move that project in column two towards that outcome in column three. What would be the very next action that you actually need to take? All right, so just take a moment to think about that. Right. You got it? Excellent. Now, fortunately, we're not going to go around the room and say, what did you all discover? But the one thing that I'm... But the one thing I'm hoping that some of you will have discovered is, well, I'll ask you anyway to make a show of hands. Could I have a show of hands of those who discovered that the final next action that they've put down in column four is not really the same thing they wrote in column one for the original item? Hands up those who would say that what's finally in column four is, is somewhat different in either, you know, accuracy or detail or even, you know, it's different altogether. 
So you'll notice that there's quite a large lot of hands up around the room. Now that's a totally expectable response because what I'm going to suggest is that in most people's to-do lists, it's simply lists of stuff that's overwhelming people, but they haven't gone through that little process discipline of saying, but what is the next action? And that one single question transforms our lists into much more helpful things. What's the real next action? Now, by the way, that's why I use this. Because when I capture a task, I'm capturing only the raw idea. So I capture it before it's lost. But what I put into my real next action list is a more considered note of what I think the real next action is. And there's a little bit of time in between writing it here and putting it there. I'm part um, Scottish, and so what I do is I wait until these are on sale, and you can buy them in a sort of a pack of about 50 for 10 cents each, and then I, I take them home. And, and now I have the luxury of knowing that I can, I can pull my ubiquitous attention capture tool out and I can make a note, and frequently I'll make a note of only one thing on a piece of paper, and then I will luxuriously pour or, or rip that entire piece of paper out knowing I can afford that. It, it fits my notions of fiscal prudence. And at the appropriate juncture, that piece of paper will now be translated into my true next action list on my computer somewhere. But in between, I've engaged the brain to get the right thing on the list, you see. Hugely helpful. Can I commend that idea to your attention? I've found that extremely helpful in terms of being clear on what it is that I need to do. Here's the third thing in terms of practical ideas, and then we're going to move on to something altogether different. So I don't know if you know much about goals, but lots of people have goals. Generally, goals are perhaps a little bit more serious than New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions generally get to about the 20th of January and start to fade, don't they? Uh, but goals could be more serious. What do you think the percentages of people achieving their annual goals? Answer, mm, actually fairly small. Do you know the single greatest reason why people don't achieve their goals? Now think about this, even from the truth's perspective. Well, because they don't have a mechanism to connect their daily lives to their goals. Ah, that's where this little trick comes in. So here's another idea that I have found very helpful. It's part of how I focus my attention every single day. You want to be focused in an age of, of distraction? Then can I commend this idea to your attention as well? Now, let me start with a, a, a physical demonstration. Um, the US is always different to the rest of the world. I understand that. But in New Zealand, that piece of paper would be called A4. It's sort of like US letter, but it's what the rest of the world does. It's called A4. But if you fold an A4 into two, you get a smaller document, which is called conveniently A5. Now, they might be pretty much the same with US letter. What's a US letter folded in half? What does that produce? Half a US letter. Oh, dear. OK, so if I say, if I say I, A5, you'll understand what I'm talking about. A4 becomes A5. It's all perfectly simple, really, in the metric system. So. What I do with that piece of paper is if you imagine I take a, a pencil and I go down that way and down that way and I create by two lines simply four boxes. And in those four boxes, I do this. Actually, if the truth be known, I pre-print those. There's method in my madness. And then... What I've got is goal one, goal two, goal three. I only have three goals. I only have three goals for a year in terms of my business. I only ever had three goals for my year in terms of a business. And I have three major spiritual goals every year. Uh, because the law of diminishing returns says the moment you add more goals to that, the chances are you'll, chances are you'll diminish accomplishing any of them. Three goals maximum. And then, would you like to know what boxes four is about? It's called other things. Because every day of our lives, we've got other things to do, lots of things that have to be done. But you see, what's good about this is that that little piece of paper, which I would tend to fill out towards the end of the day, what am I going to do tomorrow? What's the top three things I'm going to do tomorrow? And I try and populate those into those four, three boxes about the goals that I'm working on. What am I going to do tomorrow that will advance my goals? Now, if I do that every day, do you think there's a better chance that I might make progress towards those goals? And the answer is absolutely, because I connect with them every single day. Yes, there might be other things that have to be done, and there might be some days where the other things column, you know, fills up the whole day. 
But if I come to the end of a week and I've never got anything into box one, two, or three, there's something wrong, isn't there? Either I don't believe my goals, or I'm pretending I'm so busy I can't get on with my goals, or I'm not delegating enough to somebody else, but whatever it is, I'm not serious enough about my goals. Now, here's the thing. I work from home, so the commute's good. But the trouble is, I sit in an office in the morning, and I've got this little list of things you see to do on my little piece of paper. By the way, do you know why I do it that way? Well, because I can get two for the price of one, you see, out of an A4. If I cut A4 in half, I can get two A5s. So again, it's fiscally prudent, but there's a reason for it as well. If I write those same four boxes in a piece of paper that size, compared to a piece of paper that size, which size do you think your brain prefers? The brain prefers the smaller size. The brain says, oh, only that size. Oh, I can probably handle that. Oh, that seems like a lot of stuff to do. Same four boxes. It's a really funny thing how the brain works. So you can trick the brain. So even doing it in that smaller size, the brain says, I can accomplish this. I can do it. Let me go. It's small enough for me to cope. But you see, because I'm self-employed, here's the truth, brothers and sisters. To be honest, no one has any idea what I'm doing in my office day by day. And to be also completely honest, nobody cares what I'm doing in my office day by day. So how do you hold yourself accountable? And the answer is this little piece of paper is my accountability partner, even for my spiritual goals. It stares, it sits there in the morning and accuses me to say, you wrote this stuff down that these were your goals for tomorrow. Now what are you going to do then? Are you going to get onto this? Come on, my boy, get cracking. So it's like a little piece of paper that holds me accountable for what I'm supposed to be doing that day. Do you think there's a chance I might accomplish those goals at the end of the year? Absolutely. I'm connected to them every day. And in those four boxes, I write the next actions off my next action list of things I've got to do to either move my goals forward or do other things that must happen in that next 24-hour period. And that piece of paper greets me every morning when I arrive, accusingly. It's an accountability partner right in my little room. Can I commend that to your attention? It's how we focus in an age of distraction. These are the critical things we've got to do today. If you don't do that, you can have a whole year that's frantically busy and you accomplish nothing. Now, you can do this for families as much as for businesses. We can certainly do it in our spiritual life. I've got two lists, one for my business, one for my spiritual life. Same four boxes. Right, let's come to some other stuff then, shall we? Um, I'm going to recommend two books this afternoon. The first one, I'm going to chew through a bunch of slides at a rate of knots uh, to really just give you a sense. I don't expect you to remember any of this. I'm going to fly through it so quickly you won't, but I just want to make you feel so uneasy, so very, very uneasy, that you think, I better go and buy that book. In fact, I suspect that Brother Cornelius has got the book. So the first thing we need to do in terms of focusing in an age of distraction, is to be absolutely clear that we recognize shallow thinking. So this book is called The Shallows by Nicholas Carr, and it says on the front cover, how the internet is changing the way we think, read, and remember. And the basic thesis of the book is that the internet was created so that we become addicted to distraction. And in the end, those sound bites that our brother referred to are so small and so relentless that we cannot live without them. But in the process, he says, it isn't just making us think in a more shallow way, it's physically, physically rewiring our brains so that we cannot think deeply. It's a physical change to the brain. Simeon's comments about the neuroplasticity of the brain is at work here every day as people access the internet. It's shallowing our brains. So I'm just going to run through some pages here and just capture some key ideas so that I just leave you with that lingering sense of unease. I want you to feel uneasy about the whole matter. Unease in this context is good. So one of the things that he says in the book is that it was once assumed that long-term memory was a warehouse of facts. But in fact, he says, and notice the little blue bit, long-term memory stores what's called complex concepts or schemas. 
So a schema is a definition for like a body of knowledge tucked away in your brain somewhere. So if someone has studied engineering, they've gone and bought the textbooks and passed all the exams, and now they've got a, a schema of engineering knowledge in their brain. So if they read another book at, at some stage on engineering, they'll make sense of it, won't they? Because they've already got a schema of knowledge in their brain about engineering matters, and they'll see new ideas and applications from that book they've read. But if you'd read a new engineering book and you've never studied engineering at all and you've got no engineering schema in your brain, well, the book won't make sense, will it? You've got no idea what it's talking about. But relate it to a schema of knowledge that's already in your mind, and now what does it do? It enriches the schema that you've already got. So this becomes quite crucial. So it says here that by organizing scattered bits of information into patterns of knowledge, schemas give depth and richness to our thinking. Well, brothers and sisters, we've got a whole schema of knowledge in our brains about the thinking of God and the thinking of divine principles. We have a whole schema of spiritual thinking that's been building in our brains so that when we read another passage in the Bible, we add to our existing schema of knowledge in that area. And it all sits in long-term memory. You think long-term memory affects behavior? Yes, it does. But if it sits in short-term memory, it doesn't. We've got to get it into long-term memory. Now, what it says here is, and I just draw attention to the blue bits, the depth of our intelligence hinges on our ability to transfer information to long-term memory into those schemas. And he says, imagine filling a bathtub with a thimble. It's going to take a while. But you see, that's what we do. When we read a book, second paragraph, we concentrate on the text, we pay attention to the text, and we can transfer most of that information thimbleful by thimbleful into long-term memory. We read a book and we savor it, and gradually that information is being passed into long-term memory and added to the rich associations of our, of our schemas of knowledge that we already hold in that place, in the mind that God's given us. Now, let me show you what happens when that's... Um, when that's challenged by the internet. With the net, we face many information faucets all going full blast, our little thimble full overflows. What we transfer is a jumble of drops from different faucets, not a continuous, coherent stream from one source. We're now actually taking information that's jumbled from all over the place, and it's already, the thimble full's already overflowing. You can't cope with it. So when the water overflows the thimble, we're unable to retain the information or draw connections. We can't translate the new information into schemas. Our ability to learn suffers. Our understanding remains, why, surprise, surprise, shallow. So going to the internet is sort of like being drowned by the degree of information that submerges us in its quantity, but none of it actually went into long-term memory. This is what it used to be like when we read a book, brothers and sisters. You know, there was a, a marvelous thing called the lone writer and the lone reader. You'd read a book and you'd become so absorbed that what would happen is the synaptic connections start to fire with the writer and suddenly you're immersed, you're following the writing. Oh, I know what's going to happen. Oh, I know what's going to You turn over the page and say, yes, I knew that was going to happen. And you're totally immersed as if no one ever has read this book before apart from you. And no one else has ever written the book. It's just you and the writer alone. Imagine if we studied our Bibles, brothers and sisters, like this. Alone with the writer, who's God. But you see, that practice of deep reading is already fading because the internet's destroying it. And the reason why it's destroying it is because what we're not doing when we're online has got as much neurological consequences as what we are doing. So he says, neurons that fire together wire together, but neurons that don't fire together don't wire together. So as the time we spend scanning web pages crowds out the time we spend reading books, as the time we spend exchanging bite-sized text messages crowds out the time we spend composing sentences and paragraphs, and as the time we spend hopping across links crowds out the time to devote to quiet reflection and contemplation, the circuits that support those old intellectual functions and pursuits weaken and begin to break apart, and in the end, your mind can't do that anymore. Even when you say you can, you can't. You can't pick up a book and read 30 pages and follow the argument. It's beyond you. 
That's why Brother Thomas was already no longer being read. People can't get through a paragraph of saying, oh, this is far too hard for me. I need to go back onto the internet and go surfing. Because their brains have been rewired to the point where they cannot do it. Imagine when they can't do that with the Bible, brothers and sisters. This is the challenge. You see, what we remember and what we forget is all to do with attention and the degree of attention that we can pay. And somehow the internet doesn't service that idea of attention very well. In fact, this page says that reading is tactile as well as visual. Real reading is multisensory. There's a crucial link between the sensory motor experience of the work and the cognitive processing of the text. The shift from paper to screen doesn't just change the way we navigate a piece of writing, it influences the degree of attention we devote to it and the depth of our immersion in it. Screen-based reading and learning is not the same as physical books. It's cognitively different. So I'm not at all sure, brothers and sisters, that it is a good trend to see developments of people doing this with their Bibles. Not at all sure that that's a good trend. Because what they don't realize is even the way they read that is fundamentally different to a printed physical book. Digital versus printed is completely different. So let me just finish these off because there's too many of them. And I'll get to the end. Let me just slide forward here. But the point about all this is, I think you should go and buy that book. Um, if you haven't already got it, and I'm not saying that people haven't got it, uh, I can't just find my... Let me just, uh, I'm going to have to do it this way, sorry, because I can't find my little cursor to see how I can move this forward. So, moving forward then, uh, I'm going to come to this next stage here. When we're really doing a go good job of, of reading, we need to learn how to do deep reading. And this is from a different book. Uh, this idea is from a different book. It's called Learning How to Read a Book. Very good book called Learning How to Read a Book, by the way. And I highly recommend that one as well, but it's not my main one for today. But one of the things it recommends is that you annotate with marginalia. You should always read with a pencil in hand. And what he says is you should inhabit the book. Get, get, in, get into the margin and start challenging the text and worrying about it and asking questions and underlining good things and debating it. And so here's a, non a person who's not writing about the Bible that says the best way to inhabit a book, to take ownership of a book, is to mark it up. Well, isn't that interesting? Inhabit it. Take ownership of it. You don't take ownership when you buy a book. You take ownership when you've read it to the point where you're convinced by it and you've marked it up and it's become yours. So here's the second book I recommend, and that's this one here, Embracing Deep Work. Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World, Surprise, Surprise, by Professor Cal Newport. So his thesis is all about deep work. Well, you could certainly translate that to biblical matters, couldn't you, brothers and sisters? So he gives two definitions here. So deep work is professional activities performed um, in a state of distraction-free concentration that push cognitive capabilities to their limit. <laughs> These are efforts that create new value, improve skill, and are hard to replicate. But shallow work is non-cognitively non demanding logistical style tasks often performed while distracted. They don't create value, and they're easy to replicate. I wonder which of those two we tend to default to, do you think, deep work or shallow work? What most people are doing in organizations is busy sending emails to other people who receive emails so that they can send an email to the person who sent the email to them. And you'd be astonished at the amount of money that companies pay to allow all their people to be actually like human routers sending emails. For around about 30% of their day, by the way. Companies pay a fortune for people to be email recipients and co-respondents. And they're flat out doing shallow work. So this book says, mm, Tom, you got into some deep work. But he says, if you want to do deep work, you have to have some principles. Now, think about this, brothers and sisters. This is a Gentile writer writing purely about the logistics of work with no rel relationship to the truth or divine principles. But this is what he says. He says, there's four principles if you want to do deep work. First of all, you have to have a, a work ritual. If you're going to do deep work, you've got to be serious about how you do it, where you do it, when you time it so that you do it properly. That sounds to me like getting Bible study sorted out. Second thing he says, 
I've got this problem again, is you've got to cultivate quiet. So you've got to understand the, work of the, the, the idea of work bursts. 90 minutes, by the way, is the maximum time for optimal attention. At the end of eight, 90 minutes, the brain needs to have some restoration. You've got to quit social media, he says. Get off it. He's absolute. Get off it. He says, if you want to do deep work, you're wasting your time on social media. That's shallow stuff. So he says, what you should do is, and I'll only deal with a couple of these things, go offline for 30 days. If you didn't die, stay off. <laughs> because people think, I've got, to be, I've, got to be, I've got to have all these things. Why? And of course, you've heard of FOMO. It's the next generation's curse. The generation below you and me. Fear of missing out. If I'm not online, I won't know what people are doing. Who cares whether they had eggs for breakfast yesterday on the other side of the world? Does it really matter? Is it essential? So you see, these are things that a Gentile writer has said, and yet they would be quite good principles for Christadelphians to think about, wouldn't they, if we're to actually learn to focus deeply in a world of relentless distraction. If they could do it, I think we could. So he says, treat shallow work with suspicion. Its damage is often vastly underestimated and its importance vastly overestimated. Be aware, brothers and sisters, that everything that we do on social media has a consequence in our brains, and most of it's bad. So uh, let's finish with um, a few minutes on Nehemiah chapter 8, because it was about attention management, you see. So are you ready? All right. Now, close your Bibles. Let's test our attentions, shall we? So, it's a case study. It maybe, hopefully, will prove my thesis for the day. How good's our attention? So, I won't ask you to write these down because... Um, we're running out of time, but let me just put the questions to you. You can score yourself privately to see whether your attention is up to speed. So the first question is, what two things is Ezra called in this passage? Don't answer now, just think about it. The second question is, how many hours did Ezra speak for? The third question is, was the pulpit of wood Ezra stood on new or old? The third question, the fourth question is, on what day was the reading done? And the fifth question is, which city gate did they assemble before? So how did you go out of five? Would you like the answers? Test yourself. He's called Ezra the scribe and Ezra the priest. You get that right? Excellent. Well done. How many hours did he speak for? Mm. Uh, six, from six o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock noon. Was the pulpit of wood old or new? Answer? New? Yes, it was made for the purpose, says the record. And what day was the reading done? Uh, the first day of the seventh month, says verse 2. And which city gate did they assemble before? Would anyone like to say? The water gate, well done. So now you can score for yourself what you got in terms of how many out of five as a bit of a percentage on your attention. Well, let's make it easy, because actually one out of five is, maybe if we made it one out of ten, you could, you could turn it into a percentage, couldn't you? Here's another five questions. When exactly did the people stand up? Uh, ooh, that's interesting. Did they stand up? Yes, they stood up. Yes. Uh, what posture did the people adopt for prayer? Where did the two groups of 13 men stand? Be careful, be careful, be careful. What did Nehemiah do at the meeting? What key word is used at least six times in this passage? So here's the answers. The people stood up when Ezra opened the book. They bowed their faces to the ground and worshipped, it says. Uh, one group stood beside Ezra and the other group stood among the people. Nehemiah helped to teach the people. 
And the key word I think that's perhaps the most significant in the passage is the word understand, which is used six times. They understood, they understood, they understood. They wept because they understood what the reading was about. It's about understanding. So that's out of 10. Now you can score yourself out of 10, and that's a percentage as to how good your attention is, you see. So maybe if you got less than 5 out of 10, you'd say, you know what, I think there's grounds for me to think I could improve my intention a little further. You see, it's at work even as we read our Bibles at a Bible school. Are our attentional powers as tightly focused and intense as they could be? So what do you make of this, brothers and sisters? Did you notice that phrase in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1? They gather themselves together as one man. But did you hear the Bible echoes? Did you pay attention? Where does this come out? What's this leading us to? Isn't this Hosea chapter 1? Gather together and appoint themselves one head. Isn't this John chapter 11? That he should gather together in one the children of Israel, the children of God that were scattered. Isn't this Ephesians chapter 1? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one and we suddenly realize that hidden in the story of Nehemiah chapter 8 is actually the work of Christ. Isn't he the one into whom they're all going to be gathered? Did you pay enough attention to notice that? What about this one? Did you notice the last phrase, the joy of the Lord, the joy of Yahweh is your strength? But you see, that's Isaiah 12 and Luke 2 and Romans 5. The joy of Yahweh in the end is the work of the atonement through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the joy of Yahweh ultimately is our strength. This chapter's got something to do with the atoning work of Christ. Did you notice this one? He had people on his right hand and on his left. But isn't that Judges 16 and Samson, the one with his right hand, the other with his left? Isn't this Luke 23, the one on the left, the one on the right? Isn't this John 19, two other with him on either side, one? Isn't this the crucified Christ, brothers and sisters? Hiding in the story of Nehemiah chapter 8? Did you notice that? Was your attention focused enough to see that? Or did you notice this one? He opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. Galatians says, before whose eyes, before whose sight, Jesus Christ has been publicly portrayed. Luke says, all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things that were done, smote their breasts. And John 12 says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die And suddenly that phrase about Ezra being lifted up above the people in the sight of everyone is, again, there's something going on here in this story, don't you think? Hidden layers? Was our attention deep enough to notice all that? And if that's true, brothers and sisters, what would you make of Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 4, which you don't need to turn up when it says that he was upon a pulpit of wood? This one who's got those on the right hand and on the left, who's lifted up above the people and who will gather all men into one within himself, who's lifted up on a tower of wood in this story. It's all about attention, brothers and sisters. We've got to learn to cultivate it so that the deep things of the word suddenly come to light and we rejoice that the powers that God has given us, we have not lost and we have not permitted ourselves to be distracted by the world about us. We've used those powers instead for the glory of God and paid attention to what he's written. On your behalf, I'd like to thank our brother Roger for his thoughts and his words this afternoon. He's certainly give us, given us a lot of things to think about and even more to put into practice when we leave this Bible school to manage our attention and our goals through, through the year and through our lives. So I'll now call on our brother Luke Colby to, to conclude our afternoon with prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, hallowed and glorious be your great name in all the earth. We come before you now thankful for this time we've had to consider the attention that we ought to give to your words, to your truth. 
We pray that you would help to strengthen and encourage us. Help us as we know we continually fall short. Help us not to be distracted by the things of this world that might take us away, take our attention away from following after you. We pray that you would guide and strengthen us, help us to renew our minds day by day, help to strengthen and encourage us that we might focus our attention and our resources on your word of truth that might develop in us a longing and a passion for the day to come, to seek out your scriptures of truth that we might be renewed and transformed into a disciple of your son. We pray for your continual guidance and strength. Help us this week as we interact with one another, that we might be strengthened and encouraged thereby, that we might be able to develop as we go back to our daily lives, a focus and a desire and attention on your word. We thank you now for your many continual blessings toward us as we ask these things in your son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.